Chapter One of the Friendship of Anne: A Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Friendship of Anne: A Story by Ellen Douglas Delan. Chapter One. The Stuarts lived in a flat in one of the large apartment houses that are to be found in almost any part of New York. It was situated on one of the west side streets, not very far uptown as distance is counted nowadays. But at the time this story opens, the city had not grown to its present enormous proportions and to live near 50th Street was considered to be almost in the country. The Stuarts were not New York people, but had come there recently from their former home near Baltimore. Mr. Stuart was dead, and Robert, the eldest son, was in a good position in a business house in New York. It was time for Murray, the second son, also to be settled in business, and New York offered more opportunities, it seemed, than Baltimore. There were other reasons, too, which made a change of residence appear desirable, and after much thought and consideration, Mrs. Stewart sold the country home which had come to her from her father and where all her children were born, and with many misgivings and much natural regret, took up her abode in the great, crowded, hurrying, lonely city of New York, for it is a lonely place in spite of its many thousands of inhabitants to those who go there as strangers. This was Mrs. Stewart's opinion, but her children did not agree with her. Bob went off every morning to his work with a feeling of satisfaction, a glow of elation, he too was now one of the world's workers and intended to make a name for himself sooner or later that should become known and respected and powerful he had plenty of ambition and he was young and strong anything is possible under those conditions murray also was full of hope although he was still smarting under the disappointment of not going to college his father's death had rendered this out of the question, and the boys, those who had grown up, must begin to work quickly as possible and support themselves. The family was large, and there was not much money. He had been fortunate in getting something to do almost at once, and although it was a position of very small importance, it might lead to better things. There was another brother, Philip, a boy of eighteen, and there were three sisters, Margaret, Sydney, and little Annabel, who was only six. Sydney, who was just fifteen at the time they moved to New York, is the heroine of this story. She was a girl who, without being exactly pretty, was very nice to look at. Her eyes were so honest and looked so directly into yours when you talked to her her hair was soft and thick and fluffy being neither very dark nor very light her mouth was rather large but her smile was charming and her teeth were white and good her skin was very fair she usually had a pretty color which came and went constantly if she was interested in talking or if someone spoke to her suddenly she was a somewhat shy girl, but she had plenty of courage when necessary. I was always very fond of Sydney Stewart, and I hope you are going to like her too. She had plenty of faults, who has not? But she was a very lovable girl. They came to New York in the early spring and settled themselves in the apartment which Bob, who had been there for a year, had found for them. It was on the ninth floor and was reached by an elevator. The view from the windows was fine, looking across the roofs 
of the neighboring houses towards the river and the palisades if one glanced down into the street so far below one felt dizzy the people walking there appeared like pygmies but the stewards told one another that the air was clearer and more bracing up where they were it was like living on a mountain top they passed the summer in town breaking the monotony by an occasional trip to the resorts near by and spending whole days in central park which was easily reached and where they could take their books and work and luncheon it was on their return from one of these days out of doors in late august that mrs stewart broached a subject on which she had long been pondering and upon which she had at last made up her mind margaret who was in her mother's confidence on all matters knew what was coming but to sydney it was like a bolt from a clear sky the boys were out and amabel had gone to bed so the three were alone sydney was sitting at the open window reading she was apt to be reading when the bolt fell sydney dear it is getting too dark to read any more and i should like to have a talk with you said mrs stuart she was a small slight woman whose face showed that her life had its share of suffering we must decide about your schooling this winter in fact i have already decided oh mamma dear i do hope it is to study at home cried sydney impetuously throwing aside her book and coming to her mother's chair she drew up a stool and seated herself at her feet you know almost everything yourself and if there can possibly be anything you don't know margaret does i am sure you are as good as any two teachers to be found anywhere do let me study with you at home that is out of the question dear margaret is going to do other work which will be much better for her and bring in almost as much as we should save by letting her teach you besides it would not be especially good for you home lessons with a sister never give the same discipline and you ought to have other girls to compete with i do not approve of shutting you away from girls of your own age and as we are such complete strangers in new york she sighed as she said this there is no way for you to make friends unless you go to school i think too but mamma interrupted sydney surely you are not going to spend all that money that a new york school would cost how can you ever afford it you haven't heard me out dear my plan is to send you to boarding school boarding school sydney gave this one exclamation and then stopped her feelings were too great to be put into words boarding school there was silence in the room for a moment but mamma she said at last i should think boarding school would cost a great deal more than going to school in new york and living here at home with you no said mrs stuart it will not the school i mean is kept by the misses wickerstam their family were old friends of your father's family in fact he knew them and once did them a great service i will not go into that now it is not necessary but they have always appreciated it very much and they have offered over and over again to educate one of his daughters of course during your father's lifetime this was not necessary but now things are different and i wrote to them a few weeks ago do you mean i am going as a charity scholar asked sydney in a stifled voice the stuarts were all proud no not by any means i offered to pay the full price of tuition but they begged me as a personal favor to them to allow them to pay off the debt they consider is still owing to your father 
by giving you your education i could not permit that so we have compromised and you are going at half rates you need have no feeling whatsoever about it sydney it is really quite just of course it makes it much easier for me in many ways it will be very hard to let you go but i feel it is for your good it is an excellent school known everywhere to be of very high standing a number of girls from new york go there girls from the very nicest families i want you to make up your mind to it dear and to get all the good from it that is possible oh mamma mamma i don't want to go sydney's voice was choked and she gave a little sob i have never been away from you in my life i know it dear and for that very reason i think it is going to be good for you you must trust your mother's judgment sydney she knows best you may be sure it is hard for me to let you go and i should not were i not very sure that it is for the best after a little while sydney grew calmer and by the time she went to bed she had begun to see the brighter side of the question though it sometimes requires diligent search to find it she had learned that the mrs wickerstam school was at kingsbridge massachusetts her father's family had come originally from kingsbridge though none of the name were left there now nor any near connections it was a country town and sydney loved the country she would gain an excellent education which was important and would make friends of her own age and sydney said margaret after they had gone to the room which the sisters shared mamma could not tell you this herself but she wants you to get away for a while and be among people who who don't know she thinks it will be good for you there is no chance of any one there knowing for all the girls are from new york or boston no one from baltimore or anywhere near there the misses wickersham know but they will not speak of it how do you know they won't because they are very nice people they are real ladies and besides they feel that they owe so much to papa he and his father saved them from some terrible trouble but will it be honest not to tell the girls asked sydney suppose i should get intimate with some of them would it be fair not to tell margaret was silent for a moment while she thought it over finally she said i don't think it is our duty to tell out everything sydney this is a family matter entirely there are some people who know of it if they chose to tell they can do we can't prevent them but there is no reason why we ourselves should speak of it it doesn't concern you alone i don't think you would really have the right to tell it the best way is to be silent and dignified and perhaps in time we shall all live it down even even he will good night little sister don't let us talk any more and try not to think of the sad things we have had we have had some bright things too and i think school will be bright for you when you once get there and are used to it i should have loved to go to boarding school i have read some very interesting stories about boarding school murmured sydney just as she was dropping off to sleep they are always getting into scrapes and having midnight suppers and being caught by the teachers i wonder if they do that sort of thing at mrs wickersham's or if they are all too proper i doubt it their being too proper said margaret i never heard of a crowd of girls yet who didn't get some fun out of life wherever they are you will like it sydney good night dear 
Sydney, being possessed of a fair amount of common sense, decided next morning that as it was clearly decreed that she was going to boarding school, she might as well get all the pleasure from it that she could. She entered into the preparations for going away with an interest that gratified her mother, who understood her children thoroughly and knew that it was not an easy manner for Sydney to go away from her and her home. The boys were told of the new plan, and they did what they could to help matters. Bob brought home a pretty leather traveling bag, which he had brought for her to carry on her journey. Murray spent some money he had saved for some books on a nice umbrella. Philip had no money and was earning none, but he gave her something which was precious to him and which it touched Sydney very much to receive. She knew that it was not easy for Philip to part with it. This was a little stuffed owl. He brought it to her room one day when she was packing. Philip was three years older than she was. He was very tall and had outgrown his strength. His eyes and hair were dark and his face was pale. Strangers who saw him in the street or elsewhere were apt to look at him a second time in a startled fashion. His face was so young to look so sad. Here, Sid, he said, giving her a box carefully tied up. I brought you my owl. You can set it up somewhere at school. I haven't got anything else to give you, and you always liked it. But Phil, exclaimed Sydney, you think so much of it. You don't say anything more, he interrupted. Just take it. He would have liked you to have it. Don't say anything. He put the box on the table and left the room. Poor Phil, said Sydney to herself, sighing. What are we going to do with him? He will never get over it, never. I wish I didn't have to go away to school and leave him. I could cheer up Phil when no one else can. It really doesn't seem as if Mama were quite wise to let me go. But Sydney was as unconscious of the future and of the way things that we do not wish to do sometimes work together for our good as we all are. She little supposed that her going to boarding school would affect Phil's future as much as her own and that they should both live to bless the day that saw her take her departure for King's Bridge. The days that bring great changes into our lives are seldom marked with red letters at their dawning. At last she was ready to go. Her trunk was packed and strapped and sent off. Her new bag and neatly rolled umbrella were carried to the station by Philip the other boys having been obliged to go downtown before it was time for her train. Mrs. Stewart, Margaret, and Annabel also accompanied her, Annabel being the only one in a really cheerful frame of mind. Is a boarding school built behind a wall like that? she asked as they walked down Madison Avenue and passed a house that was being repaired and which was screened from the public by a tall fence why no said sydney why should it be oh i supposed it was cause it's a boarding school i supposed it was made of boards replied annabel at this they all laughed even philip and annabel who did not like to be laughed at grew very red and would not say nothing more until they reached the Grand Central Station at 42nd Street. Here she found so much to interest her that she forgot her indignation. I wonder if those girls are going to school, said Sydney, indicating a group of laughing, happy-looking girls, who, with an older lady, were standing near the ticket office. But even if they are, it isn't at all likely they are going to wickersham school 
they must be lots of boarding schools that you can go to from this station the stewards watched them for a few minutes presently they all moved away going towards the door through which the people passed to reach the trains in doing so one of the party left behind her bag which she had placed upon the floor while they stood there philip discovered this and after an instant's hesitation he was a very shy boy he hurried forward picked up the bag and ran after them i beg your pardon he said taking off his cap as he caught up to the girls isn't this your bag you left it on the floor two of them turned at once and the taller of the two put out her hand and took it oh thank you she said her face breaking into a charming smile it is mine i should never have missed it thank you very much it was thus that they saw anne talbot for the first time she turned and disappeared into the throng of passengers now pushing through the door from which the train had been called it proved to be sydney's train also and there was only time for a hurried good-bye i wish that girl were going to knightsbridge she whispered to margaret wasn't she fascinating perhaps you will find her there laughed margaret trying hard to be very cheerful stranger things can happen and presently they had all left her and sydney stuart was seated in the train that was to carry her from the great world of new york to the little world of kingsbridge end of chapter one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter two of the friendship of anne a story by ellen douglas deland this librivox recording is in the public domain this year of eighteen eighty when sydney stuart went to school will i am sure seem like medieval times to my readers there were no electric cars then the telephone had been invented but was not in general use there was electric light in the cities to be sure but it was regarded with the respect due to a new discovery wireless telegraphy was undreamed of and automobiles as well as bicycles were unknown but in spite of these drawbacks girls and boys managed to enjoy life quite as much as they do nowadays and though college life for women was still regarded as somewhat unusual there were always boarding schools of course and of all the boarding schools none was more popular than the wickersham school at king's bridge to begin with it had been in existence long enough for the mothers of some of the present pupils to have been educated there themselves that alone was a good recommendation for in those days to be modern was not considered so imperative as it is now miss wickersham had taught history mathematics and natural philosophy in eighteen sixty just as cleverly and comprehensively as twenty years later the mothers of the girls of eighty had their kings of england and the prosperities of matter at their tongue's end and wrote a graceful slanting hand what more could they ask for their daughters so anne talbot and dorothy fearling and gertrude king were all sent to the wickersham school when the proper age of fourteen or fifteen arrived they had been there a year and were returning from the summer vacation as old scholars when the stuarts first saw them in the grand central station naturally the chief excitement among them after greetings had been exchanged was the subject of new pupils this was a matter which could not be definitively decided until the junction was reached and the change made from the new york express for boston 
to the little local train which ran between the junction and kingsbridge there had been suspicions and cognitations on the matter all the way from new york for in spite of any number of other passengers girls of that age discover one another with amazing quickness anne talbot whispered to dorothy fearling who had been her most intimate friend for more than a year and who was travelling back to school with her that she was sure the tall girl at the front of the car was bound for wickersham's and probably also the girl with the light frizzy hair three seats ahead of them gertrude king whose own seat was towards the front with her mother came back and told them there were two more new girls just behind her she was sure they had been talking about knightsbridge and said they had heard there was a boys school there too you may depend upon it they are new girls announced gertrude do you like them asked anne eagerly they are horrid returned gertrude one of them has on a linen duster and the other has her hair done in the queerest way you ever saw for girls of those days were very much like those of to-day in the matter of prejudice not to wear one's hair in a braided knob at the back of the neck when one was fifteen or braided and turned up with two ribbon bows one on top the other at the neck was to be very peculiar indeed but have you seen the girl who is up at the very front of the car asked anne still more eagerly what is she like yes i have seen her and heard her speak to the conductor and he said change at the junction and so of course she's going well she has a voice like a uh, oh it's some kind of music exclaimed gertrude enthusiastically i know i shall love her but she looks awfully poor who cares for that said anne the girl with the frizzy hair is listening whispered dolly better be careful and then the conductor shouted clapman junction all out for wade madison and kingsbridge this train express to providence and boston and with a great amount of bustle and hurry all the girls new and old seized their luggage and hastened from the car some of the newcomers were accompanied by their mothers but the tall girl who was sydney stewart and she with the frizzy hair were quite alone they stood at opposite ends of the platform and watched their companions until the little local train came puffing to the station then they took their places and sydney found herself next to the girl with the frizzy hair it was but a short ride to knightsbridge through a country that was already putting on its autumn dress the railroad followed the course of a narrow stream a tiny little river which bore the imposing name minnie the girls familiarly called it minnie and hailed the first glimpse of it from the car windows with cries of joy dear old minnie exclaimed anne talbot i can scarcely wait to get there girls i am to have my own canoe next spring i learned to paddle at york this summer oh take me take me anne i just love a canoe came in chorus i've been playing tennis all summer said dorothy there is nothing like it the greatest fun in the world do you suppose dear wicky will let us have a court there is a level place behind the house that would do i mean to ask her she'll never let us that would be entirely too much fun oh how queer and horrid to get back to school and have a teacher dodging our footsteps fancy wicky playing tennis in a short skirt and a jersey laughed anne there are the steeples of knightsbridge hooray after all it's fun to get back i'm glad i'm not a new scholar do you remember how we felt when we first came and no one spoke to us for ages 
I mean to speak to those new girls over there. They are sitting together, but they haven't said a word to each other. I've been watching them. She rose as she did this and moved a step or two down the aisle of the car. She was a tall girl with dark, tightly curling hair, a bright color, and very white teeth. Her mouth was large and her nose a snub, but her merry brown eyes and her ever-changing expression gave her face a greater charm than that of beautiful features. Her friends looked after her admiringly. You would have guessed at once that Anne Talbot was popular. You are the new scholars, aren't you? she said, as she stopped beside the two strangers. I am sure you are going to Miss Wickersham's. Yes, we are, said the girl with the very fair frizzy hair. At least I am. I can't answer for anyone else, she added, glancing at Sydney beside her. A real snubby look, Anne said afterwards in describing the conversation to Dolly. I am new too, said Sydney shyly. Have you been there before? Oh, yes, I am quite an old girl. I suppose you are dreading it awfully, just as I did. But you needn't. You will soon get used to it. And we're not as bad as we look. We don't bite. Sydney laughed softly. The fair-haired damsel took her literally. Oh, I don't think you're bad-looking. And as far biting, oh, she broke off suddenly on catching the quizzical look in Anne's eyes. Of course I know you don't really mean that, and she laughed a rather belated giggle. I'm so glad you spoke to me. I've been feeling so lonely. Then why haven't you been talking to your neighbor? asked Anne bluntly. As long as you're both new, I should think you would have made friends. But here we are at Knightsbridge, dear old Knightsbridge, and there's the barge to meet us, and Miss Lovering, dear Miss Lovering. She caught up her bag and umbrella, and in the excitement of arrival she soon became separated from the strangers. To Sydney, this moment of arrival was a great relief. She had been conscious since they left the junction that the girl beside her regarded her with disapproval. Not only had she piled the seat high with luggage and been obviously unwilling to make room for Sydney, although it was the only vacant place left in the car, but she had drawn aside her skirts with conspicuous care and had turned her back as much as was possible to her new neighbor making it evident that she intended to have nothing to say to her. Sydney looked at her own rather shabby blue dress that had been considered good enough for traveling, and then at the elaborately trimmed garments of the other girl, the long mousquetaire suede gloves, the dozen bangles that rattled and clanked with every movement of her hands, the locket and chain on her neck, the conspicuous hat that was set back from the much frizzed bang. I suppose I do look shabby, she said to herself with a sigh, shabby and country, though I do live in New York. But these girls over there are a great deal nicer looking than this one. I wish I might know them. I wonder if they are going to the school. Shortly afterwards, her wish was gratified when Anne Talbot came and spoke to them, but she was too shy to say much in return. She could only smile. The sweetest smile you ever saw in your life, Anne described it. I may as well announce at once that though Sidney Stewart is my heroine, Anne Talbot comes next in importance, and Bertha Macy the girl with the fair frizzy hair is going to be very prominent in these chronicles of the Wickersham School. You will all recognize her. There is a girl like her in every school, I suppose, for Bertha Macy's 
exist of every age the world over and it is probable that they all go to school at some period of their career the outgoing mail the next day took three letters which perhaps will bring these girls before you in the clearest way and introduce you to them properly and then we can go on with the story from anne talbot to her mother dearest mamma we are again at old knightsbridge got here safely and the only accident was my leaving my purse in the new york train or else my pocket was picked i don't know which it only had about two dollars left so it was a good thing it didn't happen when it was fuller if you send me a new one i like russia leather best and one of those new clasps and please put a little more than two dollars in it for in the meantime i am borrowing of dolly and i should have to pay it right over to her and so have none left they have awfully fascinating butterscotch at tinkerham's this year and the best caramels i have ever tasted there are several new girls one is named sydney stewart such a beautiful name and she comes from new york i am sure you would approve of her for she is very quiet and doesn't use much slang and has kind of a queenly look though she is not quite as tall as i am i shouldn't wonder if she wore one of those descendants of mary queen of scots they can't trace she doesn't use slang because she hardly ever says anything at all she is so quiet so she is safe that way you see if you're much of a talker you really are forced to use slang to help you out but really dear mamma i am trying not to she has a roommate that is just too too for anything there i go again couldn't help it to save my eye oh dear mamma how shocked you will be but i simply can't write this over and i know you will be so glad to get my first letter you won't care as much about the slang as you willed later in the term but about this other new girl her name is bertha macy she wears sixteen bangles and they have little elephants and pigs and hearts and things hanging from them and they rattle like sleigh bells i have my doubts about their being real silver she rooms with sydney stewart and i pity sydney some of the girls think they are going to like bertha macy but i don't give my love to papa and when you write to bud i am going to write to him soon write soon for i miss you fearfully i forgot my bible please send it with the new portmanet your lovingless daughter anne from bertha macy to her sister dear carrie here i am at boarding school at last and i think it is going to be a success some of the girls are very nice there is one named anne talbot from new york who is just fine i admire her immensely and intend to have her for my most intimate friend she rooms with a girl named dorothy fearling now a meek sort of a little thing but i can soon cut her out anne dresses beautifully and is evidently rich she lost her purse on the train and does not seem to care at all she has lovely clothes the material i mean they are too plainly made to suit me when i get intimate i am going to advise her to have them made differently she evidently knows the nicest people my roommate is new and i can't bear her prunes and prisms just expresses what she is i shall make her life just as miserable as i can so as to get rid of her one of my bangles is getting tarnished already and i don't know what to do about it 
for the girls all admire them so and are always looking at them they will be sure to notice if i gave up wearing one so i think i shall have to take off the little fan from it and pretend it is broken i will send it away to be mended pretend and you can buy me a new one and send it they are forty-nine cents on sixth avenue you know the kind it has a fan an opera glass a pig and a heart hanging from it get it soon and i will pay you when i come home at christmas i think it is going to be great fun here i am glad i came i have made all my plans about anne talbot i have got to be very careful for she is the kind that always wants to look out for a girl like sydney stewart sort of protect the downtrodden you know but sydney stewart puts on a great airs and acts as if she were a millionaire as far as that goes she actually pretends to look down on me the teachers are so-so i am not sure about them yet pratt's boys school is in knightsbridge i didn't know that till i got here sam kennedy we met at atlantic city is there that will be fun i shan't tell anybody yet i know one of the boys i think you are real mean not to let me bring your gold pencil it would have made such an impression yours bertha from sydney stewart to her mother my dear dear mother i do wonder how you are to-day and how you are getting on without me i miss you terribly and wish i could talk to you instead of writing i liked the school very much the miss wickershams were very kind when i arrived but i have scarcely seen them since there is so much going on all the classes have to be arranged and the rooms etc miss lovering has charge of that the rooms i mean she is very nice and teaches arithmetic and geography to the little girls that come in to day school i have gone into the third class in everything except mathematics you know how stupid i am about arithmetic we had an examination this morning and i am afraid i did not do very well but in dictation and another spelling examination i did not have a single mistake my roommate is a girl from new york her name is bertha macy she spends perfect ages in front of the glass frizzing her hair with a slate pencil and a candle there are some very nice girls here i think but i scarcely know any of them yet anne talbot from new york is lovely and she has been very kind she is one of those we saw at the station it was her bag that phil picked up isn't it strange that she should be here when i so hoped that she was coming to the school she is evidently the most popular girl in the school and always has lots of girls with her dear mother i wish i could be such a favorite is it wrong to wish that i am afraid people don't like me very much because i am so quiet well i am going to study very hard and be able to teach and earn my own living so you won't have to worry about supporting me i wish we could all move here away from noisy new york and live in a nice little house this is a beautiful place i love it dearly already i have the queerest feeling about it just as if i had lived here before i love it so i suppose it is because my ancestors used to live here i have seen the house where papa's grandfather lived i will tell you more about it in my next letter i must stop now and study two of my new books have been given to me i'm afraid they will cost a lot but if we are careful not to deface them 
we can sell them back when we are through with them at the end of the year i have taken several second-hand ones and they are quite cheap i think my roommate looks down on me because i did but i thought i ought to as long as we have so little money good-bye dear dear mother give lots of love to margaret and the boys and annabel i wish i could see you all to-night your very loving daughter sydney end of chapter two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter three of the friendship of anne a story by ellen douglas deland this librivox recording is in the public domain the old town of kingsbridge is in the hill country of new england but exactly where it is not necessary to state it is not in the mountains neither is it very near the sea but in a gently rolling country with a blue line of hills in the distance from between the peaks of which fainter and more shadowy hilltops are discerned beyond whence the pure mountain breezes blow upon king's bridge some little streams take their rise there too flowing down to join the minnepaquick river and so on to the sea the sun sets behind those distant hills and as one watches the golden glory one wonders what the sun drops down to see way off in the west behind the screening mountains for in the hill country as in life there is always something just beyond our vision that we long to know about the town of kingsbridge was settled back in colony times and that its founders were men of means and good taste a stranger would recognize at once the houses were large and square and imposing and most of them were painted white there were a few modern houses but one marked them as being unusual they were all set in their own gardens with long box bordered paths leading from the gates beyond which in summer roses and lilacs and quaint old-fashioned perennials bloomed in delicious profusion and in which the yellow golden glow and deep-hued chrysanthemums made sunshine now that september had come miss wickersham school was in one of the largest of the houses but it was of modern architecture with a french roof and a turret it had been built rather recently by a man who had made a large fortune and then lost it and miss wickersham had bought the home with the money saved from long years of teaching there was a fine lawn in front which was reached by an avenue of elm trees on one side was the garden and on the other a grove of pine trees beyond which a high stone wall separated the school grounds from those of a very old stone mansion this old stone house stood amid dark masses of cedar and pine trees the sun never touched the lower part of it and the dampness of ages had caused the wooden shutters to rot and the sills to crumble away the garden was overgrown with weeds but some of the flowers still managed to live and bravely bloomed each successive season at the back of the house was a tower at the top of which hung a great bell the tower was of stone and part of it had fallen but over the ruins ivy climbed and grass sprouted in the crevices the purpose of the tower and bell whatever it had been had long been a mystery and year after year the girls at miss wickersham's wondered queried and wove startling theories as to its origin only from the upper windows could they see within the precincts needless to say that the old brathwit place was of most intense interest to the more imaginative of the girls and in the weaving of ghost stories 
or other strange tales the scene was invariably laid there there was one room in the schoolhouse which afforded a fine view of the mysterious place this was on the corner of the third floor and from one of its windows you could see over the cedars which just at this point were lower and more dispersed than elsewhere miss wickersham usually gave this room to two of the new girls and this year it was appropriated to sydney stewart and bertha macy there were two little iron beds in the room two chests of drawers and two tables each girl thus had her own domain as it were although occupying the same apartment sydney's table was by the window overlooking the braithworth place while bertha macy's commanded a view of the grounds back of the school it was very comfortable and pleasant for the misses wickerstam believed in doing what they could in this way for the girls entrusted to their charge there were three misses wickerstam the principal herself and miss abby and miss jenny her sisters and assistants miss jenny was the favorite with all the pupils she was very pretty with soft fair hair and a lovely color in her face quite young too as anne talbot informed the new girls young that is compared to her sisters said anne she is very old when you think of her age for it is known to be twenty-eight which is really quite ancient but she is such a dear she seems as young as anybody the girls were in the almost deserted schoolroom when this conversation took place anne was seated on her own desk with her feet dangling dorothy fearing who was never very far from her was in the chair belonging to it bertha macy sat on the edge of the platform on which stood the teacher's table and sydney stewart was on one of the recitation benches the room was very large the walls were hung with maps and blackboards and there was no furniture but the desks and chairs the windows which reached almost from floor to ceiling were painted in a way that resembled frost so that it was impossible to see through them in the morning the room was bright enough but at this hour of the afternoon it was rapidly growing dark for the day had been cloudy and rain was now falling it pattered against the windows on the eastern side and the wind had begun to howl rather mournfully school had been open for several days and the first strangeness was wearing off a little for sydney but as she was a very shy person she had made no advances to the other girls which of course does not hasten the making of friends this afternoon she had been on her way to her room when anne talbot and dorothy fearing called her into the schoolroom bertha hearing them had followed anne had surveyed her darkly for a moment and had made a funny little grimace behind her and then decided to make the best of the inevitable for she is always going to be around you may be sure of that she whispered to dorothy i shall give her a good snubbing some time but not to-day oh no not to-day returned dorothy who was always for peace i've got two awfully important things to speak about announced anne one is about pratt's school and the other is about the club i just want to tell you that the boys who go to pratt's are awfully common we none of us have anything to do with them at least very few of us there was a great fuss once a girl who isn't here now got up an acquaintance with two of them and there was the greatest time i thought i would give you a hint how do you know they are all common asked bertha oh i know they are they always have been you had just better look out not to attract their attention in any way my cousins the tracys who live in knightsbridge told me 
they were all cads who go there and to have nothing to do with them bertha was silent she decided not to say that she already knew one of the boys there the other thing is the club continued anne i suppose you have heard about the club it has been in existence for nearly a year and it is called the k q c what does that mean asked bertha well that is just the mystery we don't tell the meaning of the name to the new members until the end of their first school year instead of testing the girls for membership before they get in we let everybody in and if anyone breaks the laws of the k q c she is quietly dropped do you see why i never heard anything so queer exclaimed bertha we might do it the first minute of course and then you'd get a sort of a notice the second time you'd get a censor the third time out you'd go with full explanations if you manage to stay in the whole eight months of school you will be a full member from that time until you leave school unless you break the laws later see it is really a good idea for everybody has a chance to belong there can be no influence or anything like that and it doesn't make any difference about being intimate with anybody or having any pull anywhere there i suppose that is slang but it just exactly expresses what i want to say and i've simply got to use it sometimes we can all become members if we want to i was made president last term for this year so i am the one to tell you about it and we hope you will both belong what do you do at meetings asked sydney oh we do all sorts of things we have fun of some kind once a month we have a secret feast the great point is that no teacher or outsider shall know it is being held then we have our weekly meeting with no fixed day but planned with the greatest care and secrecy we do stunts that's a new word i got from ned when i was at home ned is my brother you know at harvard it means some kind of a performance oh the whole thing is great fun and i advise you to join do all the girls who are here now belong asked sydney no there are twenty-five old scholars this year and seventeen belong they all had the chance but they went out for different reasons it isn't always the same reason but it is never told and they never tell themselves they are always ashamed of being put out so you see no one can guess exactly anything about it of course the girls who go out sometimes give a sort of reason but never the real one now do you two girls want to be in the k q indeed i do exclaimed bertha i think it must be just too perfect for anything i'm crazy to belong very well then your name will be put down and you will get a notice of the next meeting it will come to you in a strange way but you will know it when it does come you can't mistake it how about you sydney will you join won't you to anne's surprise sydney hesitated the color came and went in her face as it did when she was speaking or about to speak i should love to she said at last her face now crimson but but i don't know whether i can afford to afford to echoed bertha why the idea well i suppose we have to pay something for the feasts and things said sydney in a low voice but very bravely and really i i am afraid i couldn't dorothy was about to speak but anne interposed that is all right she said you need not bother about that i will tell you later how that is managed 
she pinched dorothy's arm as she spoke until dolly almost cried out in pain but knowing that anne was pinching her for the very purpose of ensuring silence she bore it with the endurance of a stoic then we will consider you both members continued anne speaking very fast and you will come to the meeting and see what you will see it is getting late yes there goes the bell for study hour we have just gotten through in time and the four girls hastened from the rapidly darkening schoolroom and took their way to the library a large room across the hall where lamps were lighted and everything made ready for a quiet hour with their books after that there was an intermission of fifteen minutes to allow the pupils to prepare for supper and then at six o'clock the big bell clanged and they assembled in the dining-room for their evening meal there were two long tables in the dining-room at the end sat the misses wickersham and miss lovering and halfway down the sides of each table another teacher was stationed in this way a general supervision was established and a conversation maintained that was eminently proper and improving in its tone miss wickersham poured the cocoa at one table miss abby at the other while to miss jinny and miss lovering was relegated the task of helping the cold ham the food was good but it was simple and to hungry schoolgirls it sometimes seemed scanty very often a box from home would arrive for one of them and it was always shared among one's particular friends there were a number of sets in the school as was natural among so many scholars but on the whole the spirit of good fellowship existed among them all and there was a very strong esprit de corps there seems to be no english phrase which exactly expresses this that was never wholly outlived by the graduates of the wickersham school this evening miss wickersham as usual had a topic ready for conversation this had been her habit from time immemorial sometimes it was an event in history sometimes one of the day aunt talbot declared that she had a list headed topics for the evening meal which she had been compiling for years and which was used alphabetically that may or may not have been true but on the night of which we are speaking the subject was queen anne and her times which certainly was near the top of the a b c's miss wickersham was a tall thin lady whose hair had grown gray in the service of teaching she was an extremely angular person and she dressed with the utmost precision and a due regard for the fashions of the day a black silk dress with a bit of white tulle about the neck formed her daily afternoon toilet her hair was arranged in puffs with the front parted and crimped and she wore eyeglasses she had a cold manner and a voice that sounded like sleet on the window according to aunt talbot she opened the conversation by asking what had made the reign of queen anne a celebrated epoch the name of anne and the cottages she built replied aunt talbot promptly explain yourself more fully miss talbot said miss wickersham frostily she knew that something dangerous might be coming she always mistrusted anne anne dimpled and smiled her dark eyes glanced rapidly from one end of the long table to the other why the name goes without saying of course all of us annes are something queer and startling and you know about the cottages miss wickersham don't you she must have been very much interested in architecture i always think of queen anne as sitting and planning queen anne cottages how else do they get the name can't you fancy the dear old queen her crown on her head 
her sceptre leaning against her chair a row of architects that will do miss talbot can any one else at the table tell me for what queen anne's reign was noted there was a pause then sydney stuart her flushed cheeks showing her timidity at speaking in public turned towards the principal it was celebrated for her turning away from the real heir and bringing over the hanoverians and making george the first king it ought to have been her young brother a stuart a jacobite among us exclaimed the irrepressible anne you have a family feeling for them haven't you sydney i was sure you were descended from mary queen of scots if things had gone as they should have perhaps you would now be seated on the throne with your crown on queen sydney miss talbot your good spirits carry you too far observed miss wickersham reprovingly miss stuart your reply shows thought but it was not the answer i am looking for can no one help us out the reign of queen anne was celebrated said bertha macy for the poets and writers and great literary men who lived then miss wickersham bent upon her the most amiable gaze of which she was capable you are right miss macy that is the answer and she continued to enlarge upon the subject go up head whispered anne not daring to say anything more aloud in another minute bertha jumped and gave a little cry a piece of bread fired with unerring aim had hit her on the head and lodged there no teacher knew whence it came for miss wickersham was speaking to the maid and the others were occupied what the pupils knew was another matter anne herself was calmly cutting her ham when they looked at her End of chapter 3 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 4 of The Friendship of Anne A Story by Ellen Douglas DeLand This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That same evening, when at half-past eight, the girls had gone to their rooms as usual, at the hour there was a faint tapping upon one of the windows of the corner room occupied by sydney and bertha it was still raining and the wind had risen into gusts the sound was no doubt caused by a branch of one of the trees that grew so near the house on that side but presently it came again one two three in slow regular taps sydney glanced at bertha she was removing her bangles as she stood in front of the dressing-table and apparently was unconscious of the mysterious noise in a moment it came again and this time it was quite loud rat tat tat directly on the window-pane bertha turned quickly what was that she exclaimed i don't know said sydney it has been going on ever since we came up i thought it was the wind at first or a branch or something but it can't be that there it is again this time the window-pane was struck six times oh bertha gave a little shriek it must be ghosts this room is haunted and she started toward the door oh how absurd laughing sydney how can you believe such nonsense i am going to open this window and see what it is but it might be someone trying to get in exclaimed bertha in an agitated whisper if you do i shall lock myself in the closet all right you can but how could any one climb up to this window to get in the next time it raps i'm going to open the window bertha retired to the closet there was no way of locking herself into it but there was a feeling of safety for her 
by merely being on that side of its door she peered out through the crack divided in her mind between timidity and curiosity and watched sydney's proceedings sydney stood by the window and the next time the sound came which it did after an interval of a very few minutes she raised the shade and flung up the sash just beyond the window sill a small white object danced and bobbled up and down it looked at first like a little package then it seemed to her to be a box she put out her hand and touched it yes it was a small box stuck on the end of a fishing pole which evidently was being held by some one in the room directly underneath as she took hold of it a voice called from below in a sing-song tones take me read me tell it not the k q c is near this spot she obeyed the command and removed the box from the fishing pole which was hastily withdrawn and closing the window she turned towards her roommate who crept from the closet it is the k q c she cried laughing oh bertha the idea of you thinking of ghosts see there is something in this little box about it i suppose don't tell will you sydney that i was so frightened urged bertha i really couldn't help it promise won't you why of course replied sydney more intent on examining the contents of the box than anything else she had untied the string and now found inside the cover a wad of paper folded very small upon being opened it proved to be a sheet of foolscap paper at the top was a little pen and ink drawing cleverly done of a door with a large number four on it the door was partly open and the back of a girl's figure was seen entering while other girls crowded after her beneath the picture was neatly printed the following lines you are summoned to the k q c its members you will surely wish to be so to-morrow at the magic hour of three oh come to the jolly jamboree walk 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 the upper corridor tap 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 at room number four forth from the end and four on the door there you will find us members by the score of the k q c the k q c oh what can it be at the end of the year you will see what you'll see then you'll know ho 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 what it is to be a member of the k q c what fun said bertha taking possession of the paper when they had read it a second time you don't want this do you anyhow it is meant for me as much as for you and i am making a collection of all kinds of souvenirs and interesting things like this i do wonder what they do at the meetings and what we have to do to stay members it certainly is mysterious sydney did not reply she was as much interested in the club as bertha was but she was still uncertain as to whether she should belong there were reasons why she should not she told herself but at three o'clock the following afternoon she was one of the girls who walked along the upper corridor and knocked upon the door from the knob of which hung a large sign of number four it was anne talbot's and dorothy fearing's room and it presented at first glass a startling glare of color one half of the room was hung with red there were crimson curtains at the window on that side a crimson table cover flags of the same brilliant hue and each adorned with a very large h decorated the walls pictures were hung by red ribbons everything that could be touched by color was in crimson 
the other half of the room was equally gaudy but the tint was blue blue window curtains blue flags blue ribbons of course every girl who reads the story will at once guess the significance of those decorations anne talbot was for harvard because her brother was there dolly fearing for yale for an equally good reason the two were intimate friends and devoted to each other but this was the subject upon which they could never agree and they carried out their loyalty to the brothers to the utmost extreme anne talbot being president of the k q c for the year occupied the chair this was an old high-backed wooden rocking chair and to make the position of president more imposing the chair was placed upon the bed ruth carter one of the older girls was the secretary sat at a table on the president's right but fortunately in security on the floor the other girls sat wherever they could find a resting place some in chairs some on the window sills some on the floor or on the trunks sydney found herself perched upon the washstand from which the pitcher and basin had been removed to the safety and seclusion of the closet there was a great buzz and chatter until anne's little french travelling clock on the bureau struck the hour of three then the president rapped with a hairbrush on the wooden arm of the rocking chair and called for order immediately there was silence the old girls knew what was expected of them the new members were only too anxious to hear what was coming the president cleared her throat with impressive loudness and opened the meeting there was not so much known in those days about parliamentary rules for the conducting of public meetings and the proper carrying on of clubs but anne was equal to almost any occasion and nobody thought of suggesting that anything she might say or do was out of order nor of criticizing her in any way here we are again she said and i for one am mighty glad we are here there is nothing nicer than the k q c and before we go any further i shall like to have you all unite in a cheer three cheers for the k q c hip hip hooray 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 the cheers were given with a shrill will that would have made the rafters ring had there been any rafters then the back of the brush was again applied to the arm of the chair and the president proceeded it is nice to see so many of the old members and i'm sure you will all join in welcoming the new three cheers for the new members hip hip hooray again there was an uproar of sound again the brush was called in to service and quiet reigned once more of course continued the president these new girls are simply aching to know what is expected of them we all know that they will find out soon enough we were in their shoes last year we at this time were tearing our hair to know what big things we had to do to stay in the dear old club we were just as ignorant as they it is a very queer club unique i should say i hope your new members will like it and all stay in next year will be on hand to welcome the new girls just as we are doing now well i have said all i can think of and so i will ask the secretary to call the roll and read the rules and report ruth carter who was a girl of seventeen rose and opened a blank book from this she read first the names of the old members each one of whom responded with the word present then the names of the five new girls who answered likewise 
then came the constitution and bylaws which were as follows the k ku c of the wickersham school was founded in eighteen seventy eight consequently it is regarded as a very vulnerable institution and one which every one should be proud to join all pupils at the school are eligible for membership until something proves that they are not the first year is one of mystery and mistakes after that everything is explained and membership is a simple matter rule one to k q rule two to obey summons to meetings rule three to pay fifty cents at the beginning of each year towards defraying necessary expenses of feasts rule four on receipt of a box of eatables from home to share it as much as possible with other members rule five in every way to be loyal to the club if for any reason a member resigns from the club she is expected to remain loyal which means that she will tell its affairs not to one and will guard the its secrets to the end of her life rule six k q and again k q ruth carter read these rules aloud in a clear voice of authority then she continued the book is ready for signatures and i will ask each member as her name is called to step forward and sign the book which signature holds good for the whole year the old members will come first the signing occupied some time and thus sydney had the opportunity to consider the question of joining fifty cents was not a very large amount to pay yearly and she was quite sure that her mother would not wish her to decline on that account the matter of expense was really she had for refusing and there were many reasons why it seemed desirable to join so when her turn came she also went forward and signed the book the secretary was the last to put her name which she did with a flourish there she exclaimed that is done business is now over and other more important affairs will be attended to has anybody anything to suggest i have said molly meigs who was also one of the older girls i wish to present three opportunities will the secretary please make a note of these three opportunities a very poor family by the duck pond a drowned trodden mongol dog living on main street near the post office the little lady next door she paused and immediately a hubbub of many voices broke out i speak for the downtrodden dog the poor family by the duck pond i have a splendid idea for them why molly what do you mean by the lady next door there is no lady next door the house is empty the president wrapped her brush will miss meigs kindly explain said she as soon as she could make herself heard what she means by her extraordinary statement we have always been giving to understand that the houses that the house next door was empty save for the ghosts and figures of our imagination hear hear cried the audience admiringly if some one is really living there alive and like other people the k q c ought to know about it of course but it is something for the k q c to take any active steps about it is replied molly meigs when the clapping which followed anne's remarks had subsided somewhat i can say no more i can only state on my honor as a member of the k q c that 
a lady is living next door here to the surprise of everybody sydney stuart spoke there is a lady there she said eagerly and then stopped abashed at hearing her own voice in such a large meeting really and truly exclaimed anne have you seen her how did you see her you know our room is on that side and i can see into the garden or at least into little part of it it is so overgrown that you can't see much the lady was walking there leaning on some one's arm her maid i think why has the k q c any business to know more asked ruth carter the secretary of course i have no doubt that molly meigs knows what she is talking about but at the same time i would suggest that such people as would live in the house next door are not very likely to be suitable objects for the work of the k q c they are insisted molly they certainly are you don't know a thing about it ruth though you may think you do you always she was interrupted by an outburst of song k q c whatever you do k q chanted all the old members molly laughed good-naturedly and said no more well whatever we may think about the lady next door then there can be no doubt about the downtrodden family and the poor dog said anne oh no i have gotten them mixed it was a downtrodden dog wasn't it kindly let us hear from some of you at the next meeting on those subjects then she sang who will scale the wall this was most mysterious to the new members it all seemed mysterious but this was the most so and the response delivered by all the old members in a sing-song voice made it still more remarkable i answer to the call tis i will scale the wall and who will climb the tree and i my sisters three tis we will climb the tree and who will walk the rope tis difficult to cope but i will walk the rope and who will only wait i if it be my fate tis i will only wait these responses were sung in unison in a slow chant the new members looked at one another in astonishment what could it all mean truly the k q c was a very unique organization the meeting is adjourned said the president notices of the next will be served at the proper time and place we've got to hustle now for it is five minutes of four and the professor is coming at four for the lecture on greek sculptures there was a rush for the door and in a very few moments the first meeting of the k q c for the season was a thing of the past sydney stuart found it difficult at first to put her mind on greek sculpture but finally she succeeded in banishing all thought of the club for the present after the lecture came the study hour and it was not until the short period before supper when she and bertha were in their room that she could think or speak of the strange proceedings that had taken place in room number four bertha was apparently much excited by the events of the afternoon isn't it the oddest club you've ever heard of she exclaimed in her interest in making her speak in a more friendly manner than she usually showed sydney it was evident to the most casual observer that these two girls 
did not like each other and it was not all the fault of bertha sydney had taken very little pains to conceal the fact that she did not find her roommate congenial she made no effort to overcome her dislike but on the contrary rather encouraged it she felt that she was above bertha whose lack of refinement showed itself in many ways and it never occurred to her that it would be better to look for the good that was in the girl rather than think so much of the bad that was there what does it all mean said bertha why did they all begin to shout k q to molly miggs what had she said that made them do it she was only talking about who was in the house next door no it was more than that said sydney she began to say something to ruth carter and they interrupted her that way k q k q whatever you do k q it certainly is queer and then that song about when who will scale the wall do you suppose it will be a whole year before we know more no said bertha of course it won't i shall find out before i have been here many weeks i can just tell you that the poor family and the dog didn't sound very interesting nor the lady next door but i shan't miss a thing for you don't know how things will turn out oh sydney would you mind lending me a handkerchief i can't find mine anywhere but i know i have lots of clean ones sydney reluctantly opened her trunk and took the upper one of a neat pile goody how carefully you keep your things said bertha as she took it i never could it isn't in me you don't have your handkerchiefs embroidered do you mine have three initials all done by hand done in ink makes them rather common don't you think so but then i suppose ink is good enough for the quality of handkerchief there is the supper bell and i haven't washed my hands do pour out some water for me won't you i'll tell you a good joke only you must never tell i happen to know that miss wickersham is going to talk about arctic explorers tonight and i have read them up in the encyclopedia why how do you know asked sydney oh that's telling there i'm ready at last End of chapter 4 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 5 of The Friendship of Anne A Story by Ellen Douglas DeLand This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It does not take long to become accustomed to a new mode of life. And before many weeks had elapsed, Sydney Stewart felt as though she had been at boarding school with Bertha Macy as roommate for as many months. School routine makes time fly quickly. Every day the girls rose at the same hour, went down to breakfast at half past seven o'clock, walked out for a breath of fresh air. The Mrs. Wickerstam appreciated the importance of fresh air from a quarter past eight to a quarter of nine and were at their desks at nine when school was opened with prayers and bible reading from twelve to half past twelve there was an intermission and at two o'clock the dinner hour after dinner until four the girls could do very much as they pleased within reasonable limits at that hour there was usually a lecture by some visiting professor or a reading or a concert in the parlor until five the study hour 
and then supper and some mild form of entertainment until bedtime sydney was what might be considered a studious girl she really enjoyed her books and was anxious to learn not only from a sense of duty but from the love of knowledge she astonished her teacher as well as her classmates by reciting the many pages of grecian history which had been appointed as their lesson almost word for word she studied everything in this thorough way except mathematics here she faltered it was undoubtedly her weak spot anne talbot dolly fearling and gertrude king who were her classmates in all else were studying algebra while bertha macy was with much older girls in geometry and sydney was still wrestling with the rule of three it was very humiliating i don't know why i can't get it straight she said one day to anne i seem to be the only girl in school who is so stupid except elsie brent miss abby gets perfectly wild with me and the more she explains the duller i get until i can't tell what the difference is between fractions and denominations and quarters and sixteenths would you call three sixteenths a fraction or a denominator asked anne her dimples beginning to show i don't know i'm sure i know you are laughing at me i am not so stupid as not to be sure of that you are not a bit stupid said you're brighter than any of us in some ways most ways i think i have always heard that some people can't get numbers into their heads but that doesn't mean they can't do other things you can write like a streak your compositions are the best in the class and look at the way you write poetry you will be elected club poet before you know it there i have made a rhyme myself that is a sure sign i shall see my bow before night unfortunately i haven't got any to see it was now sydney's turn to laugh i don't know why you are laughing said anne i say what i mean but you don't always mean what you say retorted sydney there is a difference the two girls were walking together it was the early morning promenade and as usual at this hour they filed along in procession partners were engaged days ahead for this and the girls kept memorandum books for the purpose of noting names and dates naturally some of them were greater favorites than others it was often necessary to wait a week or ten days to secure the privilege of a walk with anne talbot and ruth carter were equally popular with her class sydney as yet had very few engagements and therefore it had been a great pleasure to her when anne a day or two before had asked her to walk with her on this special morning she did not know that anne had suspected that she was a bit lonely and had arranged with dolly that they should give up the walk they had planned in order that anne might have a free morning for sydney anne talbot was always doing nice things for the girls she liked it was not easy for her to do them for those whom she did not care for it was a beautiful morning in november the air was soft and balmy and the purple haze that blended the blue of the sky the dull greens of pines and cedars the yellow of the oaks and the rich browns of old mother earth proved that indian summer was making its yearly fleeting visit there was a pervading fragrance of smoke from the fires which careful gardeners had lighted to burn brushwood and dead leaves before the snow should come the atmosphere was so still that sounds from very far away could be distinctly heard the minnepaka floating lazily from the mountains to the distant sea lay like a blue ribbon between the meadows which guarded its banks 
some crows cawed lustily from the pine trees and a chickadee sang on a brush nearby the girls were walking back from the village as the town was still called by the old residents and their way was along a country road which formed a short cut from the post office to the wickersham school the longer route was through more dignified streets and the more thickly settled part of the town they had been to the post office for the morning mail which was now in a bag and carried by miss jeanie wickersham not to be distributed until the noon recess the girls cast longing glances at the big bundle of letters that went into the bag every morning but miss wickersham was inexorable on this point as on many others no letters to distract the mind at the beginning of the day that matter had been settled many years ago did you know you were chosen asked anne presently chosen for what said sydney you will know when you know i suppose that means the k q c when any one says anything that doesn't seem to have much sense to it but really has a good deal then i am sure it has something to do with the club i hope it won't be something that i can't do properly and shall get turned out for but i'll do my best anne i wish i dared ask you something i do need advice what is it asked anne promptly i don't on giving advice i knew you had something on your mind that is the reason i told uh, i mean i was sure that there was something in the wind hurry up for we are nearly home well it is this yesterday morning i had to go up to my room in the middle of the morning to get a paper that my lecture notes were written on that i had forgotten to bring down to the schoolroom just as i got near our room the door opened and who should come out but she was interrupted by the girls in front who suddenly turned and spoke to them we have just heard the most exciting thing said gertrude king they are passing it all along the line and you are to tell the girls behind you it seems the boys at pratt's have a new trick on us you know how muddy it was when we were out in the afternoon well some of them were at tinkham's when bertha may and alice dodd were there and after they left the boys followed them and saw their footprints in the mud and had a measuring rule and measured the size of their feet did you ever hear of such a thing there is danger of their doing it all the time and we have got to be awfully careful on muddy days pass it along the line this important piece of information was passed along forthwith and as a result there was no time for sydney to finish her confidential conversation with anne for in a few minutes they had reached the school and freedom of speech was over for the time being tell me at recess whispered anne as they parted but with recess came other matters which were even more absorbing and important there were three letters in the mailbag that day which had much to do with the course of this story two were addressed to sydney stuart the third was for anne talbot one of sydney's was from her sister margaret and was as follows my dearest sydney we were so glad to get your last letter and hear all about your new friends and your studies it is a great comfort to know that after all boarding school is not so dreadful as you feared certainly it is a fortunate thing about the misses wickersham's generosity not every one would remember to show their affection for father and grandfather and make it possible for you to be there on such reasonable terms anne talbot must be charming and some of the other girls there are some you don't care for of course but that is to be expected we can't hope to like everybody 
but we can usually manage to get along comfortably and even though you are thrown into such close contact with miss m perhaps you will not mind her little feelings as time goes by the worst of all is her curiosity it would be wise to tear up all your letters from home as soon as possible you ask about phil he is doing pretty well in his new position but he is still very morbid i hope that will wear off in time but the cloud is very heavy still it was unfortunate that it should have happened with phil for he has a nature that suffers more than bob's for instance however we must hope for the best and help him to live it down fortunately no one knows of it in new york except his employer mr sherman mother went to him and told him he is a kind gentleman if ever there was one and he will never speak of it he thanked mother for telling him he was very kind to phil but of course phil has not much of a position yet just an office boy but there is a chance for him to work up i am very busy and like my work very much dear little sister we miss you still and i wish you could come home every week we are hoping to get you here for the christmas holidays but it is still uncertain the journey is so expensive Annabel sends a kiss and says to tell you that the cat from the flat next to ours came in our window and that she is going to boarding school with you next year she is a dear love from us all your loving sister margaret sydney read this letter first she fully intended to follow margaret's advice and destroy it at once but she delayed long enough to read her other letter this was evidently a communication from the k q c it was in a conventional envelope addressed in an unfamiliar hand and bearing a new york postmark so there was nothing in its outward appearance to signify the nature of its contents at the expense of much effort and trouble the managers of the club resorted to all sorts of devices to mystify the members the outgoing mails to new york frequently carried large envelopes full of smaller missives stamped and addressed to the girls at knightsbridge which the relatives at home were asked to post that they might appear to come from a distance this which was intended for sydney was in the form of an invitation mrs braithwaite would be happy to have the pleasure of miss sydney stewart's company on tuesday evening november eighteenth at seven o'clock miss stewart will please enter the premises by way of the garden wall now who will scale the wall sid answers to the call tis she will scale the wall of course there could be no doubt as to the origin of the letter sydney felt a thrill of excitement this was the first time she had been called upon to do anything of real importance by the order of the club at the last meeting there had been some further discussion of the mysterious stranger who had moved next door and it was known that she was an elderly lady by the name of braithwaite she had not been seen however and the place seemed as deserted as ever save for a woman who went every day to town with a basket and an old man who worked in the garden and about the place braithwaite hall had always possessed a weird fascination for the girls at the wickersham school and the coming of these persons to live there added to his charm for them sydney felt that it was a great honor to be chosen to investigate matters it never occurred to her that there could be the slightest harm in obeying the mandate of the club she had been ordered to go and go she would in spite of every obstacle that might arise full of the importance of the mission she gathered up her letters the two envelopes were precisely the same size and shape 
she hastily placed margaret's letter in the one that had contained the club letter and the club letter into margaret's envelope it had taken some time to study the two and there had been interruptions so that recess was nearly over when she had finished reading them she looked about for anne but saw that she was absorbed in her own letters she thought she would go up to her room therefore and look over into the braithwaite grounds it would be well to survey the new country which she was to penetrate so long after dark that evening on her way upstairs she passed a large stove which stood in the hall it occurred to her that here was an opportunity to destroy margaret's letter at once though she had a box with a lock where she kept her letters and the key of which she carried always with her she was a little uncertain of its safety strange things had happened lately she was sure so she stopped in front of the stove and threw into its fiery bed of coals the envelope addressed in margaret's hand she watched it burn with some regret she liked to preserve her letters for frequent reading especially those which brought her so much news from home but margaret had told her to destroy this at once so she must do so then with the other letter in her hand that which she supposed to be the note from the k q c she went up to her room on the stairs she met bertha macy and julia clark julia was also one of the new girls and was already quite intimate with bertha her home was in wilmington delaware and she was almost the only pupil who lived farther from kingsbridge than new york bertha and julia both glanced at the letter which sydney carried rather conspicuously she felt some pride at having been given so important a commission by the k q c and she was not adverse to having these two girls know that she had been chosen it was quite against the rules to tell what you were to do if three or four had been selected none knew of the others until the hour appointed arrived in this case she was quite uncertain as to whether she should alone scale the wall or whether she should have companions she had no intention therefore of announcing the plot for the evening but she did not hide her letter bertha and julia both keenly alive to all such matters and having scented in some way the fact that a mystery was on foot those things are apt to be in the air especially in a boarding school turned to each other as soon as she had passed upstairs there she got one said bertha of course she did that makes the third we have seen to-day gertrude king ruth carter and now sydney stewart wouldn't you give anything to know what she is to do how can we find out i think it is mean that they haven't chosen us for anything yet except that stupid trip to buy things at the store they walked up and down the garden together until recess came to an end wondering what summons could have been sent to sydney for i know from the very way she held the letter that it was a k q c said julia instead of dismissing the subject from their minds as being no concern of theirs they exerted all their ingenuity to guess what it could be the matter rapidly assumed important proportions in their opinion they felt that they must find out by hook or by crook what sydney had been ordered to do in the meantime sydney had gone to her room she laid the precious document on her table intending to lock it in her box before she went down to the schoolroom then she turned to the window close to which the table stood and gazed down into the grounds next door the old gardener was raking the dead leaves as she looked she saw a little glimpse of red which moved quickly among the bushes presently it came into sight 
and she saw distinctly a little figure in a bright scarlet cloak and hood leaning upon the arm of a maid it was the lady herself how exciting it would be to go and see her at close range it was indeed strange that not a thought of the impropriety of such an excursion occurred to her even now sydney was very anxious to be liked by her schoolmates it seemed as though this would be an excellent way to obtain popularity if only she might be successful in her expedition she forgot everything else while she thought of this and was startled by the sound of the school bell which was rung at the end of recess she ran from the room leaving her letter lying upon her table it was not until lessons were over that she remembered it and even then she did not know precisely where she had put it when she went up to prepare for dinner she had just time enough to wash her hands and smooth her hair bertha was already there sydney did not see her letter anywhere so she supposed she had put it in her drawer in her haste she did not think much about it it was not until three o'clock that she really considered the matter then she went to her room again and found it lying on her table where she had placed it in the morning it is funny i did not see it here before she said to herself as she locked it up in her box but i was in such a rush End of chapter 5 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.